Well, hello there, dear listener, and welcome back to the Inforium. What's going on, Martin? It's our well, final I'm, episode. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm getting a little teary-eyed. I feel like we got to give a graduation speech, maybe. Mm, I, I forgot my grad cap. out of storage. I, I, have a, I have a confession to make. Didn't keep the hat. I don't didn't know if keep I have the, the robes. I have no idea. Didn't keep. I did. I was about to be like, didn't keep my diploma. Shredded it. <laughs> the day they gave it to me. <laughs> they handed Who it over, it? and I threw it in the trash. <laughs> yep. I don't want this. <laughs> what am I it's supposed like, to do? Why with did this? you pay for college? <laughs> just to show you how worthless it was. I don't know. Yeah, I dude. I just went for like the free food they had sometimes. You I went paid. for the food plan. You wanted to. <laughs> I went the for the meals. dining center plan. Why That's what I went for. You had to be a student dude. to qualify. Dude, I still miss it. Hot oh, take. I, I miss I miss college all the time. Hot take the uh, the ranch dressing at the Iowa State University Dining Center. Best ranch dressing I've ever had. That's really? possibly the most Midwest thing I've ever said. Both the fact that the best yeah. ranch dressing I've ever had is from my Midwestern college, but also I'm such a connoisseur for ranch dressing that I have a catalog and ranking of ranch dressing tiers in my head. Well, and and with that though, a Midwest university having your favorite ranch, that actually it seems like you should trust a Midwestern ranch source. So it's even that's true. I mean, like they look, would be the experts, right? That yeah. I just I don't think it's ever going to be talked. I could go to some fancy restaurant in New York City, five stars. Bobby Flay has been shaking the hand of the chef, and he's like, "You're literally my god." And the ranch dressing still wouldn't be as good. Wouldn't be. And I've also right. I've like bought every brand from the store. None of them even come close. I I sad. don't think I've actually had ranch with dairy, but my favorite vegan ranch comes from Watercourse, and every other one Ooh. isn't nearly as good. So something they're doing is great. You know and what? Know you what actually have a point. Uh, Watercourse's ranch is very good. It's it's weird, especially for vegan. Every ranch. other vegan ranch is not good. I don't know what regular ranch is because you know I thought I couldn't have dairy for like seven years, so I just never had it. I don't know. Yep. Man. Well, ranch. that's that's uh, the podcast. For, we talked about ranch. <laughs> we talked for a about few ranch. That's, that's it. Goodbye. Uh, so yeah, if you haven't caught the last couple of episodes, this is indeed our final episode. It's been a long run. It's been eight and a half years of this show. Um, spent most of its life as a College Info Geek podcast. We decided to extend it an undetermined amount of time in episodes as the Inforium. This was like the epilogue. This is yeah, I think it was a pretty good epilogue. It was nearly a ten percent addition of episodes. Yeah. So I thought it was a good run. But yeah, we talked a lot about why we were deciding to end the podcast on the last episode. Uh listen to that one if you missed it. Also go read the book that we assigned as homework in that episode, The Dip by Seth Godin. Great book. And I think it's a it's a I think it's a book that almost everybody could get benefit from. Well, it's so because, short too that it's not mm-hmm annoying to recommend it it's like this isn't actually i'm not gonna waste 16 hours of your life if you don't get anything from it yeah it's like two hours tops and it's very helpful for answering the question you know should i quit something or should i stick with it um which i think is important when for a lot of us we have so many things going on that we often can't find the time to dedicate to one thing uh and that would have been i think a poetic way to end the podcast but yeah we can't go out without doing one last hurrah in our and i think a lot of the listeners favorite format five questions it is, Everybody it likes is five one questions. of the most casual formats and for that mm-hmm. it, it ends up enjoyable I, I don't feel like i had to come in with like 18 million notes or anything nope i came in with the questions <laughs> and we are going to do more than five questions it is the last episode. We got to give it all we got here. So I have an undetermined number of questions from Twitter. I asked last night during my workout and I got quite a few. So we're going to answer as many as we can uh, because we love this format. I remember the day, maybe not the day exactly, but I remember stealing this format from Listen Money Matters before I was even co-host on that show because when I was uh, in college still, or maybe this was like right after college, but I was still living in Ames. And uh, when Listen Money Matters was daily, every time that I would wake up and it was a five questions episode, I was the most excited. Because you just never know what you're going to get. It's like a box of chocolates, mother. 
Yeah. But yeah. in your case, it's like a box of live grenades. Something so, like that. <laughs> we're going to do a bunch of questions, time. but this is the Inforium. We got to do it right. So we're going to start this episode out with good old project check-in. I want to know, what are you riding off into the sunset and using your newfound tons of time to accomplish, my dude? Well, I just put out a new pixel art of my character from the game Chicory, A Colorful Tale. Ooh, it is, is it on uh, Instagram? Yep. Yep. It is uh, Wisteria, the jumping spider who meditates and does something else. They've got a second favorite thing that you can find out in the game. But that is, I'm, I want to double down on the pixel art in nature in in my own photos i want to do more music i've got that going i had i ran into a problem with how i was setting it up and i had to reconceive how i would combine piano and chip tunes mm. that should be fine now so yeah i, I want to do a lot of uh photography combined with music and pixels sweet i also very much like the spider it is and I like that you added spider. the zoomed out one as well. The composition to the zoomed out version is great. Yeah, yeah, that's. Is that's this something like you took the, recently? The photo itself? Mm-hmm. Nah, it's from Bainbridge Island. I'm fairly certain. Uh, okay. I can always I trust like the Northwest for good photos, and I have not gone into the last couple of weeks. I have not actually had a chance to go out to any cool state parks. Have you considered going to the Northwest? I have. I have. I hope to do that this year. Actually. You should, because it's a beautiful place. I would love to get to Seattle again soon, or Portland, or actually, ooh, I forgot about this. I literally am going to Portland. Oh, yeah? Uh, Yeah, when is it? I think it's going to be in October. The timing worked out perfectly, because Anna has a convention in Portland, and then she says, hey, do you want to come to Portland with me to this convention? And I'm like, well, I love Portland, so yes. And then my uh, lifting coach, his uh barbell logic and his company they're doing a meetup in portland and i asked matt like i can probably make it when is it and he's like hey it's the exact weekend that you're going to be there already so well that's cool i have a bunch of great reasons to go to portland i can hang out i can go to powell's i can read books and i can go lift weights at a fun weightlifting meet with my coach but if you're not holding a book in one hand and doing bicep curls with the other hand you can't well, be as if cool I'm as doing possible. that, then if I'm doing that, you know, it's a YouTube thumbnail. That's probably I, true. It I is think just, that literally that's how they naturally it. occur. <laughs> I think that literally is a YouTube thumbnail. <laughs> I have a, a, you know, a dumbbell in one hand, a book in the other. It does seem <laughs> like that may have been one now that I'm picturing it. <laughs> it's one of our uh, top performing videos, too. I think it's the uh, the one hour morning routine. Classic. <laughs> And then my friend Nikhil did the exact same thumbnail like a few months later. I think he was doing it to to needle me a little bit, which I found funny. All people want is to do curls and read books. In bed. Don't forget. In bed while While waking up at 5 a.m. And you know, you can't be productive unless you do everything at one time. So you got to do your workout while reading, but also listening to an audio book. Because if you're reading, you're using your eyes. What are your ears doing? Yeah, you got to make the most of your time, which means exactly. you need to overwhelm your brain to the point that nothing sticks. Yeah, you ever seen those one man bands where like he's playing the harmonica, but it's like strapped to his chest and he, then he's got the banjo and then he's playing the kick drum on one foot and he's got the cymbal on the other foot. Like that's basically productivity in a nutshell. You need to train yourself to do all of your goals at once. And let's not get into the details of like habits and subconscious automaticity. That's not even a word. No, let's just not get into that. That's, that's, that's uh, how you be productive. <laughs> one man band. Let's learn how to oh, do man. that. And make that the next video. I actually have a recommendation for people who are like, oh, I'm sad. There's no more Inforium after this. What should I listen to? Tommy Emanuel has this amazing, uh, I think it's a TEDx talk. It's called My Life as a One Man Band. It's freaking amazing. He's just this incredible acoustic guitar player from Australia. And he taught himself how to play the guitar uh, to the point where it sounds like there are two or three guitars playing, but it's just him. So he'll wrap his thumb around the back of the neck and play the bass line with his thumb while independently playing the whatever goes on top of the bass line um, with his fingers. 
like finger picking. It's incredible. And then he'll do a really, really complex percussion percussion on the guitar body while playing. It's nuts. All and right. a testament sounds- to what dedication and practice and focus can bring you in this life. Sounds like magic. Yeah. Well, it's not magic. It's just <laughs> a lot of innovation and a lot, a lot of practice. But yeah, that guy's incredible. Uh, so project checking for me, I am headed to St. Louis. Sorry, no, not St. Louis, Springfield, Missouri this weekend. Because uh, so one goal that I have been working on for probably like the past year, I would say, uh, but it's something that I've wanted to do my whole teenage and adult life is hitting a 1000 pound powerlifting total. So that means the combined totals of your bench press squat and deadlift one rep maxes. And uh, I finally hit it this month. So I mean, all thanks to my coach and the consistency that he has helped me build and the feedback that he has been giving me so I don't get injured because I kept doing that with my deadlift specifically. Um, So I'm going to Springfield to film a video with him uh, and I'm going to hit all three lifts hitting that thousand pound total. And then also we're just going to kind of go through like, you know, what did it take to hit this? If other people want to get into lifting, if there's a goal of theirs, like what, what do you need to do? What are the, what are some tips? So that's going to be fun. Haven't traveled for a filming trip in a very long time and yeah, it's going to be a good, good time. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So that's what I'm working on right now. We got videos coming out on the channel. We got shorts coming out on the channel. That's been a fun experiment. Still learning and trying things out there. Uh, And then one thing that you mentioned, and I I do want to mention this because I think it's something that I would like to do. Uh, Even though the Inforium here is ending, you and I, it's not like we hate talking to each other. And we do have this YouTube channel that we're still doing. So you had mentioned, and I agree, that every once in a while, we should just get together, hopefully in person, and just film a conversation. Have it there. Yeah. And you know, the podcast feed isn't going away. I'm not going to stop paying for hosting because I believe in leaving a, an archive of the things you've created. So this will always be here. And if there's an audio version, I could just put it on. And there it is. So yeah, it's not like a, I will never podcast again, but yeah. more of a, I want to go off and do some more things for now. This show but may anyway, have echoes. The show may have echoes. Right now, the show has questions. So we're going to get into our five plus some undisclosed amount of extra questions uh, to round out this podcast with a good old five questions episode. And the first one is, <laughs> what are your strategies for types of workouts to do when it's less than 32 degrees outside during winter? Well, you're the I, uh, workout expert. I have a story for this. So, uh, you know, COVID happened and everyone had to work out inside. Well, I moved into this house and I built my garage gym. Garages are not really inside because they're not insulated. So during the winter, it was actually often super cold in the garage. And um, I have learned through you know a lot of experience, both doing cardio and uh, anaerobic workouts that once you get into the swing of things, your body warms up and you don't need nearly as much insulation as you would have if you were just like going to stand out in the cold. So like if I'm going for a bike ride during the winter, which I do sometimes, um, I'll strip layers after 10 minutes because my body warms up and I don't need nearly as much. So actually when I was, when I was riding the bike to the office during the early spring and it was still snowing out sometimes I had my gloves because my fingers would get cold, but then I would often just have like a very thin hoodie because I didn't need a coat for the rest of my body. It was already too warmed up. Um, so that's one thing you can also get a space heater for the garage if you have like a garage gym, but, uh, I ended up buying one and I never used it because I learned like if you get out there and you layer up a little bit and then you get into it, your body warms up and you don't really have to deal with the cold so much. You won't, you won't care. Uh, one little life hack I did once is I went out one time and the bar was so cold that I could not hold on to it for more than about 10 seconds. So I took a hair dryer <laughs> and I hair dried the bar until it was warm enough. <laughs> so that's another thing that you could do is yeah, take a hair dryer and just aim it at the spot where your hands are going to be for a couple of minutes and that'll warm the metal up and then you're, you're good to go. I don't know, or, or lifting gloves, I guess. If you do this with that. like a, a wireless hairdryer in like a public park pull-up bar, 
it's way cooler. Then everybody can watch your hair dry. The <laughs> there you go. Equipment. I mean, the other thing though is like you know who doesn't have access to some kind of indoor area where they can exercise, even if it's like your apartment and you're doing some body weight exercises. Yeah, even even you know, push-ups and pull-up bars mm-hmm. you can get for reasonable. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'll, I'll round this one out with the old Nordic saying, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothes. So, you know, if you ask this question because you really like to be outside when you exercise, then get yourself some better clothes, exercise in those. People have been doing it for thousands of years. You know, you can't yeah. hunt elk in the snow without working up a sweat. Next question. How has your goal or purpose for creating content evolved over the years? as it pertains to the blog, but also the YouTube channel and the podcasts. So yeah, I guess the goals have, the goals shifted, I think more in the beginning in terms of like business goals. And then recently it's been more in terms of content focus. Uh, Because when I started College Info Geek, it was like literally just a side project. And it was actually me just being frustrated that I've been rejected from writing on another blog I'd applied to and thinking, well, I know how to set up WordPress. Let me just make my own blog. And then, you know, for the first uh, year, it was like, I'm just doing this for fun. I'm doing it because I care about this stuff. And, you know, maybe it's going to be a cool resume booster at some point. And then, you know, year two finally gets that traffic boost. It becomes like a thing that's getting a dedicated audience and starts making a little bit of money. Now it's like, hey, this could be an income source and I could do it on the side for our job you know, like while I have a job. And then you know, three years in, it's full time. So at that point, I'm like, cool, it's my it's literally my job. And I actually have to take a call because I think the delivery uh, uh. is going to be scheduled. So one second. Hello. Good. Oh, Sweetwater. Uh, good. Is this urgent? Because I'm in the middle of a call right now. All right. Thank you. The folks at Sweetwater, their customer service is great, but sometimes they call you in the middle of a podcast to talk about, I don't know, how are you enjoying your new synthesizer that you bought a year ago? <laughs> All right. I thought it was a delivery. Yes. So anyway, uh, you know, year three, I'm thinking it's going to be something that I could do next to a job uh, and then it becomes full time. So it sort of shifted from I'm literally doing this for fun to now I'm doing this with an eye towards growth, also fun. And now I'm doing it with an eye towards growth, sustainable income, building a team and still, you know, fun. Uh, And then I think, you know, the recent years have been the sort of shift away from academic focused content because let's face it, it's been a while since I was in school. And my life isn't really centered around taking tests these days. It's more around learning things for practical purposes, which I was always, you know, mostly interested in. But now there's there's not even a test in sight. Yeah. So yeah, it's been a while. Mm-hmm. You know, and I remember I think we were talking about this like three years ago. I I think I was 27 at the time. Um, we had this conversation like, are we still doing the College Info Geek podcast when we're 30? Well, we're yeah, 30 because we now. knew we knew it had to end eventually. Yeah. And so, I mean, the, I, I guess like the, the stop gap for the podcast itself was change the name because we haven't really talked about academics or college in 100 episodes anyway. Uh, and then over on the channel, it was kind of the same thing. Like, I am not a student anymore. I think I've said all I want to say about how to study for a test. But there's a lot more I could still say about, you know, how to sleep better, how to optimize your exercise routine, how to be productive, how to achieve your goals, the philosophy kind of stuff. So we slowly started to strip the college info geek branding off of the main channel. And that's why it's just the Thomas Frank channel now. I think we sat around trying to brainstorm like new names for a new website. We did. And we did. <laughs> I, I, we, I don't recall ever reaching anything that was particularly... No. No, we, we came up with a few, but I don't think they were very good. And I, you know, I, I think we just got to this point where we're like, why don't we just stick with the name we have? Like, it's just, I'm making stuff for the internet. And, yeah. and that means I can evolve over time instead of trying to find a new name that either fits a niche, uh, a niche or trying to find a name that means basically nothing. So that allows for uh, evolution. I think the only thing 
that we'd really gain by changing over from College Info Geek to some new kind of publication name would be more of an ability for me to step back if I wanted to, but I don't really want to. Like I'm, yeah. I'm happy creating content. I'm happy being the face of it. You know, I'm not really at a point in my life where I'm like, hey, I want to hire a bunch of people to kind of also be hosts and things like that. That's just kind of not what I want to do. So I'm totally fine just doing it under my name for now. Yeah, we even tried to find a name for uh, for Thomas Frank Explains. And I think I'm just really bad at naming things that aren't that are mine. I've named a few things that are other people's and they like the names. But when it comes to name my own stuff, I don't know. For the longest time, I didn't even like College Info Geek. I was yeah. kicking myself like a year after I made it like, why did I name my blog something with five syllables in it? <laughs> yeah. In three words. But hey, I mean, like smart passive income is even that's six syllables. So but yeah, it worked out. At the end of the day, you pick a name, you fill it with meaning. Other people fill it with meaning when they pay attention to it. And a lot of times they don't care. But I don't know. Some people I know have a knack for naming things like Dave, my agent, Standard, Nebula. Those are great. College Info Geek. Yeah, it's kind of a mouthful. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of a look at the evolution. I think going forward, what do you think our evolution is going to look like? Well, um, I know you want to get more into finance stuff. More, mm -hmm. um, was, I think a lot of the people that have been following this content for so long are aging with us. So I know yeah. we've been talking about continuing to branch further into the kind of adult things that we ourselves are going through and yep. we're having to figure out. Um, I know that since, uh, since I returned to the podcast after like a couple tens of episodes where I was gone in the very beginning mm -hmm. over the years, I've been trying to make things sort of accessible in a also take into account personal happiness and mental health and like difficulties that get in the way of hustle, hustle, crush it, do all your productivity nonsense. Like we've definitely branched into a, like, how can we make the most hardcore productivity stuff, but then make it good for a reasonable person's life who is busy and has things in the way. And yeah. I think we'll probably continue to do that with the other adult finance and things we get into. It's always like, here's the cool purest advice that you would hear. Now here's the version that you could probably start implementing this week because mm -hmm. it's, it's within reach. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't require you to like sell everything you own and go live in a tent somewhere. Mm -hmm. I know we had one person uh, on that question thread ask if we were going to keep the philosophy from the show here on the main channel or kind of move it over. And that is something that I would like to do. Um, a lot of those episodes more were time writing. Like literally what would happen is I would just go for a walk and I'd have, I'd like have this thought about my own life. And I'd realize this big pattern and I'd be like, we should do an episode on this. And then it would turn mm -hmm. out to be one of my favorite ones just because it's more open-ended. Yep. There isn't really a single bullet point, do it this way. And then you you did it. Congratulations. And I think that there might be more room for that on the channel as well. One thing that I've learned, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is something that's changed recently or that's always been the case, but it's just kind of been behind the scenes. But, um, to a degree, the performance of a video on a channel does affect the performance of videos going forward, especially when you when you view things in a trend. Like if you got a bunch of videos that just aren't connecting with the audience, then that can start to, you know, have the channel itself not show up as much in recommendations. But um, for the most part, and, you know, YouTube has said this uh, videos sort of compete on their own which is why you can have channels that have like viral hits sometimes like get millions of views and the next one doesn't. It's because, you know, videos are sort of seeking out an audience or the algorithm is seeking out an audience for each individual video. And the performance of the channel in general is a factor in that, but the video itself and how people are responding to it is a big factor. And that's kind of a liberating concept because I, I went through most of my time on YouTube thinking every video has to be a banger to use a Mr. Beast parlance there. Because if it's not, then it's going to just tank the channel, which is a source of a lot of anxiety. 
And, yeah. uh, you know, now I'm kind of aware of the fact that, you know, if you have a video that underperforms, that's fine as long as you get back on it and you, you know, you find a topic or you find a format that connects with the audience with the next one, uh, which means you can totally do the odd Q and a video or a long conversation video or do shorts. Like it's kind of, it's great that they've, they've set it up this way because it does allow for some more flexibility than I had previously believed. So I do think that there is room for more philosophical conversations and things like that. Uh, on the flip side, though, you know, I've talked a lot about productivity and the philosophy behind it for many, many years. And, you know, I have a lot of other interests. So one thing that I would like to see in our content going forward is more practical content on things like finance, maybe even things like fitness. Um, and I'm not going to go out and become like a bodybuilding influencer or something, but I do care about fitness. I care about things like sleep and nutrition and exercise. And I care about personal finance and where uh, the things that I care about are where my attention tends to go. So what I kind of see going forward is an evolution where the channel is not, it kind of goes from being pretty much just about productivity to becoming about like living a fulfilling life where you're continually becoming a more capable person. Uh, and one thing I noticed is uh, for the first time, at least in terms of me checking our 25 to 34 bar on the demographic chart is higher than the 18 to 24. Yeah, so they are indeed. Which, yep, tells me yeah, our, our audience is growing up aging, with us. Aging with us, they too mm -hmm. follow sequential time Yep, and have continued yeah. to watch. So, you know, when I go and make a crazy spreadsheet on how to buy a house and figure out the finances, I, I want to share that. <laughs> and I am writing a video, at least one video on how to buy a house. So that'll be on the channel at some point. So, yeah, I think that's kind of a look into the evolution that we're, we're seeing going forward. And then I guess there's the other the other part of it, which is the Thomas Frick Explains channel with the Notion content. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um. And I'm in talks with uh, one person who does like consulting and, and support about, you know, partnering up and figuring out a, a better situation for selling our templates that we're building and having a, maybe even a direct connection to people who can act as consultants. That'd be an interesting side business. And it, it's kind of funny how it's like this weird circular synergistic loop because the template that I'm launching this month is a template that we use to run our content business. So it's almost like the content business is the proof and the marketing for the template. <laughs> but then like, I keep thinking about this, but then like, uh, if you're making productivity content, it's like running this side business is almost like where you kind of test those productivity concepts out yeah. in, in like running an actual business. So it's like weirdly circular. Um, but yeah, it's cool and it's exciting. It's fun. I think that's what's important. Uh, question three. Can you take us through the journey of how your team came to be? How did each member join and how big is your team now? Also, can you talk about a time when you chose to uh, retrain your friend in a new skill versus hiring someone new? So I guess that's technically three questions. Um, you were the first team member. So yeah, let's let's hear from your perspective. How did that go? How did that happen? Uh, once upon a time. I worked a, a ton of, there was a dragon actually, but it was unrelated to the story that it just, it was in existence at the same time. <laughs> He's just there. nowhere near me though. Okay. Uh, back in college, I had a bunch of tech jobs, a bunch of web dev jobs. I did nothing but computery stuff. And then I made my own website and started my own language learning blog, Polyglot, which I am fairly certain I took down. But that was Checking. cool for a while. Did I, did I take it? I feel like I would have redirected it to like my current page just because I don't want to. There was like all the cookie laws coming into place and I really didn't feel like doing a bunch of site maintenance to keep an old blog yeah. and not doing anything with in, in line with regulations as they appear because that would be like an unforeseen problem if something happened. Mm -hmm. but, so, but I took that down now. But the point is I was doing this blog I was showing that I could do it and you were doing all this stuff. And I had guest posted on college info geek about oh, language. Right. Learning. That was, that was the first thing. It was the very, cause I didn't think about sharing what I had been learning before. 
Mm -hmm. until I saw that you had did this. I hadn't really thought about blogging or known about it, honestly. So I did that, guest posted, I think a couple more times, actually. And then at some point, you wanted to redo the website. And you wanted to redo it so that it was mobile friendly. And yes. this was something you didn't know how to do yet. And you were starting to get really into making the content. You did not necessarily want to give all the time to doing that because that's time you're not writing new content. And I, coincidentally, had just made my website mobile friendly using a, a thing showing mm -hmm. that I could do it. So uh, it was a pretty cool, pretty cool setup because I was like, I can do it, but I have this job that I'm working right here for the rest of the semester and I need it. And you had started, it had started becoming a business already. So basically we did the math and swapped. Like you yep. just paid me exactly what I would have continued to make for the rest of the semester to instead spend that semester making the website. And then I spent a billion hours making the website <laughs> and it worked. Yeah. And then, and then you did such a good job. I think, uh, I think the math we had done, cause you were making like $8 and 50 cents an hour. It, or something. it was something in that something area. Something like that. Because that's, that's what no more than 10 minimum for sure wage was at any of the university jobs. Actually, I think minimum wage was like $7 and something back when we were in college. Uh, we did the math and I think it ended up being $2,600 or somewhere around that for you to quit your job and for me to pay you exactly what you would have made. That sounds about right, but I wouldn't so have remembered it. We did that. And then I remember you did such a freaking good job because this was, this was, I think people probably forgot this transition period, but this was back when everyone was just starting to realize, oh, hey mobile browsing is a thing. People are starting to use their phones a lot. Um, this was the time where you would go to most websites and you would still pinch and zoom to see things. Yeah, this was the old days. Yep. The phones so, were made of wood. I remember most of the blogger I, bloggers I was following were still on fixed designs. And then um, I think like Derek from Social Triggers and Ramit Sethi from I Will Teach You To Be Rich, they were kind of uh, the first two that I remember who launched responsive web designs, but both of them, at least on launch were broken. They were like half working things. This was also back when you know, people had pop-ups all the time, subscribe to my email newsletter and all their pop-ups weren't responsive. Like they didn't take the time on the details and no. you did like one yeah, thing that I, I can't handle that looking around wrong. It's terrible. Yep. One thing that I am proud of, uh, and I will brag about this is that amongst the blogger crowd back then, especially amongst like personal development, business, personal finance, that kind of niche, uh, when websites started to go to, to the responsive designs, ours was perfect. And it was one of the only ones I could find that was, and that was all because of you. Like I did designs and Photoshop, but I did not know how to code this. So <laughs> You finish the design and I'm like, this is worth more than $2,600. So I think I, I think I just like wrote you another check for $2,600. This is, this is true. You did <laughs> up it afterward. And that was, uh, yeah, that, that was pretty cool. And then this, what happened after that was I kept doing regular jobs. I kept, uh, I got my job after college. I was a web mm -hmm. developer there, but then I nerve damaged my hands through a combination of many things. Um, poor posture, poor diet, no good, like five hours or fewer of sleep for like six months straight, constant drives, constant I also typing. think it was that uh, car accident. Got hit, but got like tapped in a car, neck mm -hmm. hurt for like a day. Like everything came together to give me terrible muscles pinching my nerves in just the right places to hurt all three major nerves in both hands. So yep. I had to quit my career a year into my first job out of college, which was cool and really reassuring. And, you know, I felt very lucky about it. But what was actually lucky was that at the time, your your business was still working well. And mm -hmm. we were, you were like, okay, so uh, work with me part-time and we'll get the bills covered so that my hands can heal. And this yep. is when I started to, like my job was basically to start researching and helping run the podcast and simultaneously figure out what else I'm capable of doing while my hands heal that will justify working. And that was the, really the beginning of 
this whole thing like full time mm-hmm. for realsies. So I me think, getting injured ironically led to a cool career that I'm happy with. Yeah. I, I think in the middle there, you also were on some podcast episodes because I remember you yeah, being I did, on the I podcast. I did guest on some, some of the game still ones. In Ames. We were playing Mario. Yeah. I think that uh, if people want to go back, uh, the first one you were ever on, if I, if I am not incorrect, is either the first or second five questions. And uh, this was back when like, I was just getting into YouTube and what had gotten me into YouTube was watching people like John Tron and Peter Butter Gamer and Ketikaris. So I was super into video game stuff. And I'm like, well, why don't we just like play games while we answer questions? <laughs> so the first few five questions episodes are us playing like Super Mario 3D Land while also yeah. answering questions. Good game. Which made for uh, distracted answers of dubious and questionable quality, but also true. made for fun. So I don't know. I should go back and listen to those episodes because they I remember them being a lot of fun. Yeah, I also yeah, remember probably not as solidly informative, but I remember you telling me, hey, we should not play Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 for this question and answer episode because of the copyrighted well. music. And then I was like, ah, the mic's directional. It'll be fine. And then I listened back to it and I just heard copyrighted music. And it was filled whole. with. Yeah. And we wouldn't have been able. The whole take was <laughs> dead. So that was that was a good lesson. <laughs> so I think in our whole 325 episode history, we have scrapped no more than five episodes. I can count on one hand how many episodes we've had to scrap. Yeah, or redo. I can think of two. That was the first I one. I can't think of more, but it's definitely not more than five. <laughs> I think there was one where we were both just like stupidly tired and it was just really bad. So there was one that was really PowerPointy. It might have been that one. Like we were there was no energy and we were like there was so much information and it was just Mm -hmm. anyway, I tell you. And for the next slide, Bueller. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, but the pod. So I've been guesting on the podcast occasionally. I'd still been guest posting uh, blog posts from Mm -hmm. time to time too. Um. I actually quit Polyglot around the time I hurt my nerves because I couldn't type That's very true, well. Yeah. I actually stopped capitalizing everything in my personal life to avoid using the shift key, actually. It was a weird oh, yeah. way of helping my typing feel mm-hmm. a little better because I remember, the uh, nerd was worst. When we started that, it was like, I, I think my uh, automatic investment to Vanguard every month was $1,500, which incidentally was basically like your minimum expenses. And I'm like, all right, yeah. I, I will be fine if I don't invest for three months. So I'm going to hire you for that amount of money because I have it clearly. And yeah, the question is, did you get a better than 7% return? I think I did on that. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, and like, so th- I'm not going to say that this is the world's best investment strategy, like hire your friends and stop investing in the stock <laughs> in market. In fact, that's very often a terrible <laughs> investment strategy I, you I think, shouldn't do. <laughs> I think if I hired uh, any of my other friends, it may have gone the other way. I'm not sure, but uh, it worked out well with you because of what I remember is like, you couldn't really type. So the first thing you did, and I didn't even tell you to do this, is you went out and got like a stack of these books. I can't even remember Like they were all in one kind of series, but they were on web development, marketing, SEO, like all kinds of stuff. And basically just like went through a crash course on running an online business while you couldn't type, which I think was very, very, I I did read a lot of things Mm -hmm. at that point. It was, it was a very weird path of me having to steadily and in smaller cases, prove myself over and over. And then Mm -hmm. the right moment that would prompt me to quit my career of regular full-time web development, which I totally wanted to do at the time. That was the job I wanted out of college. It's just that life happens sometimes. And Mm -hmm. what I did not want was not functioning hands for the rest of my life. You got to quit the job to heal since I I couldn't type for a long time. Actually, it took two years before the pain of that started going away on a regular basis. Yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. Right after we came to, to, right after we came to Denver, it mm-hmm. took a little bit into that. And then I was like, hey, the pain's kind of going away now. Finally, it took so long. Nerves heal like a tiny, tiny bit yep. at a time. Um, Don't injure your nerves. Uh, here we are. Take ergonomics seriously. Very seriously. Because Oh, uh, one piece of this story. I know Tom because he he was roommates with my oldest friend from middle school. So when I went to university, yep. that I, I maybe that one is not clear. 
we serendipitously yeah, we met, met through another uh, friend. A couple times when you had visited. We didn't him. like meet at a productivity conference or something. Nope. <laughs> I've met plenty of people at productivity conferences, but no, I think the first uh, time I ever met you, we probably played Smash or something. It, whatever it was, it was probably not productive. Yes. Or we probably ended up watching anime, knowing Quentin. Uh, yeah. So that, that's you. And then you've just kind of been along for the ride the whole time. And it, I mean, we've gotten to the point now where like there there's stuff that I don't even know how to do anymore. Like, yeah, the I, legal I issues with the cookie dialogues and stuff. I have no clue. I would have to go learn a bunch of stuff like that. You know, like I'm, I'm confident that I could learn most of what I needed to if you just decided to like, uh, I'm trying to think of like a top 10 anime betrayal reference here. If you decide like Vegeta me. I don't know, Vegeta, I mean, Vegeta's pretty cool. So. <laughs> He's pretty cool. I don't know. Uh, but like there's definitely stuff where I'm like, I don't even know. No, I, no idea right now. So I think that term is like indispensable. That is what you become. And yeah, it would certainly set things back a lot if somebody else had to magically do everything. I tell you the publishing schedule would take a hit. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah sure. that would not that would not be good <laughs> i better not get hit by a bus tomorrow that was like I'll, my i'll start the documentation that was like my first real like truck hit to the face realization of the power of having money around to take advantage of opportunities the, for, the not the time when your your hands got injured but when uh when i hired you to do the the web design because I was super DIY and everything at that point. And I'm like, why would I spend money on literally anything that I could do myself? Um, and then I realized like, okay, I, I have some money in the bank from this, from you know the business becoming successful. And now I realize, oh, if I take a bunch of time out of my schedule to learn media queries and to build and design a completely custom WordPress theme with responsive code, which you can't buy them right now because they don't exist yet. I'm not going to publish. So like, there it is. Holy crap. That is, that is the power of being able to, to, you know, leverage and put resources into action. Yeah. Because like now delegating I actually can hire brand somebody. New. Yep. That was, that was my first delegation experience other than I guess like having guest posters. And I, I never considered guest posts to be delegation because I guess posted myself. It was more like, I don't know. It was, it was a different feel, a different vibe in the blogging world back then. You, just, yeah. you did guest posts. You let people guest post. It was like a very collaborative thing. And now it's, I don't know, it's all SEO and algorithms and stuff. And now, now it's like everybody realized that it can be a business. So it's. Yeah. Plus like 99.9% .9 of the people trying to guest post. It's just not worth it because they're literally just trying to keyword stuff. And we get so much crap guest post yeah. spam. Systems do eventually get gamed. Yep. Yeah. Super gamed, man. I don't even think keyword stuffing works anymore. I think people have not realized that like that strategy just isn't really that great anymore. No, because if you do it Google's too long, smart. then the then yeah, Google's going to be like, oh, I see what you're doing there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll write an article, and what I do is I make sure the article is the best possible article for that topic, and I make sure the keywords are in there. But I'm the more the the main thing is like, if I'm a user and I'm searching for something like Notion's new synced blocks, any question I could possibly have. As the writer, I should be answering that in a thorough but also concise way. Shows it very quickly. And if I do that, things tend to rank well. Is Google smart now? Google's entire goal is become a proxy for the audience so we can serve the audience the best possible resource. Yeah. And then make lots of money off ads. So they've gotten to the point now where if you're a blogger or you're a YouTuber, you know, it's not like a guaranteed thing where you start a brand new website today and you make a perfect article. You're going to rank number one. But we've gotten to the point where like thomasjfrank.com is not a super authoritative domain. It's got a few backlinks. But like if you look at College Info Geek versus thomasjfrank.com, College Info Geek has many, 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 you know, orders of magnitude more backlinks from tons of authoritative sources, EDU, colleges, all kinds of stuff. Thomas J. Frank has none of that. And yet I can write an article on a notion thing or something else. And if I do a good enough job, there's a decent chance that it's going to rank on first page because the quality is the bar that you need to hit these days. It's not get 15 backlinks from all these domain authority things. Anyway, uh, 
rest of the team. So Ransom is our uh, head of the blog at this point. And he also sometimes helps with business development and sometimes does research for videos. Uh, he was a guest poster too. He was he was a reader of CIG at first. And uh, this was back when I had a comment section. So he would comment on most articles. And he was a student um, at, at a liberal arts college. I think he's actually been on the show before, like near episode 100, maybe like 103 or something. Um, and then he pitched guest posts. And again, this was back when guest posting was like more about fun and less about SEO keyword stuffing. So I let him guest post. And then eventually I'm like, well, hey, you're writing really good articles. Like he wrote this two part series on how to write a paper that ended up ranking pretty high for us and was just excellent content. I think it's still on the site or maybe it's been turned into like one article, but we have an excellent article on how to write a paper. Ransom wrote that. It makes sense because he was an English major. And uh, eventually I'm like, well, why don't I just start paying you for articles? Because you keep submitting these guest posts and they're great. And uh, eventually I did what I've done for a lot of people where I'm like, instead of paying per article, why don't we just do a retainer setup? You know, it's like four articles a month, give or take. Maybe come on, do a few other things. And right now we're just going to do retainer. So that's kind of where Ransom is now. Um, and I've even put him in charge of like some business development stuff. So that's Ransom. Um, my fiance, Anna, has been working for me for a while, though I think she's actually going to be going off and doing her own thing after this month. So I either have to take on some more responsibilities or find a new personal assistant slash, well, podcast editor, I won't have to hire for. Email that's inbox true. person, possibly. But yeah, podcast editor is something that I will not need going forward. So that's something. Your fiance, Ashley was doing our thumbnails for the podcast. I think she'll be continuing to do the uh, blog post images. Yep. But we don't have thumbnails yep. for podcasts going after this. And then we have um, Tony, who is my, well, he's my editor for video, but he's also like, he holds the camera. He does a whole lot of things. Everyone wears a lot of hats because, I don't know, the whole philosophy is be capable, be able to do things. Yeah. I never think like, oh, I need somebody specifically for animating this thing. Why don't I go hire an animator? I'm more like, hey, do you want to learn how to animate? Let's do it, man. Because I don't know. I've always liked doing that myself. So I think I tend to surround myself with people who are also very curious and want to become multi-talented as well. Um, so Tony does, you know, he holds the camera. He helps me film B-roll. He does animation. He does editing. He does sound design now. All kinds of cool stuff when it comes to the YouTube channel. He's going with me to Springfield to film the powerlifting video. Uh, and then, uh, so I met him. He is the one out of everyone that came through the, in the most traditional way. Because I put out a Google form, like an application for a video editor. Uh, his friend Natalie was a follower and was on the newsletter. So I think that's how she saw it. And then she sent it to him and he had been editing for another YouTuber. So he applied, uh, his application flew to the top and started working with him remotely. And then, uh, I can't remember who had the idea, but one of us was like, what if you, Tony came out to Denver for a weekend and we just did like a boot camp where we both just sit in a room and try to get as good as we can at editing, like try to pick a few things and just, you know, work together and just supercharge our experience over a weekend. So he comes out, uh, Natalie came out too. So I got to meet her and over the weekend he goes, I kind of like it here. What if I moved here? <laughs> um, and this was, this was another, another point where I decided to make a bet because I was paying him a certain amount of the time. Um, and I think we had been doing like a per video thing. And then I gone to like a per month thing, mostly as a way to force myself to get videos shot on time. <laughs> so he'd have them. Yeah. Uh, and then for him to move out, he had to get an apartment and to get an apartment, there's like an income minimum, like triple the rent or whatever. So what we ended up doing is I'm like, let's take a bet. Uh, I'm going to literally triple your pay so you can hit this minimum for the apartment. And it's the same thing with Martin, like dazzle me, you know, let's make a bet. Let's do it, which I think is what companies do all the time with, with hiring people. But when you, when you work with people in terms of like freelancers and freelancing and contracts, it, it's just, it feels very different when you make a bet like that. But I would say that's also paid off in spades. Tony has been killing it. He stepped up uh, and you know has acquired a ton of different skills because when he started working with me, he was, you know, mainly an editor. 
but he's got this interest in animation. He's been learning animation. Uh, any kind of like camera thing that I want him to do, he will learn it. I remember I, I bought that that cinema camera, the C200, and I was under a deadline for an edit. And I'm like, hey, learn how to operate this camera. So he went through the whole manual, like all these Canon docs. <laughs> and he's like, cool, I now know how to operate this cool cinema camera. And you know, how, you don't know how to use it, Tom. So <laughs> I had him give me a crash course on it. Uh, so that's Tony's story. And then we have one other guy, Guillermo. Uh, his is the funniest one to me. So I wanted somebody to do our podcast show notes and then also add timestamps to the podcast. And I did not want to listen through all of our podcasts and like meticulously do all these notes myself. So I made another Google form. I put it out on Twitter and somebody with a Mr. Me Seeks avatar from Rick and Morty. <laughs> <laughs> whose, whose username was Cortiflex response. Hey, I'll do it. And I'm like, cool. I'm Thank you for your enthusiasm. Um, and you know, the applications are still open, so I'll be looking at them when they're ready. And he's like, well, no, I already did three past episodes for you. Here are the links. <laughs> I look at that. I'm like, these are really good. So, um, okay. Mr. Mr. Me seeks. pretty solid entrance. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, okay, Mr. Me seeks avatar. Uh, yeah, you're, you're the one, you're the guy I'm hiring you. I don't know who you are. Don't know where you're from. Uh, you know, when I, when I first pay him, I realize he lives in Portugal. So, you know, getting to know Guillermo, he's a Portuguese guy who I think was still in high school when I hired him and he's in college now. And yeah, it's so <laughs> I guess if you want to get a job, you know, sometimes you just make your avatar be a Rick and Morty reference and then you just do the thing that the person is hiring for and you do it so good that they can't, they can't ignore you. Hey, it's like that book. So good. They can't yeah. ignore you. Yeah, exactly. Well, like That's in hiring managers, like they don't want to sift through. When mm -hmm. I was looking through, when when we've had me look through like a whole bunch of applications for stuff. I don't want to sift through all of it. If somebody nope. comes along and makes your job easy and says, I'm clearly the one you say, yes, please. I am now done. Yeah. <laughs> You've just saved everyone a bunch of time and it's clear. The answer becomes clear. It's hiring is much harder when there are question marks and like a couple of close people and you're like, I don't know which one. So it's, it's really nice if somebody comes along and it's just like, obviously it's me. Stop wasting your time. Yeah. And I mean, like that rigorous vetting process might be a lot more useful when it comes to bigger roles. Like if I was hiring yeah. another yeah, editor, we were... I would probably be a bit more rigorous about it. Uh, or, you know, we're a big company and we're just like, we need the absolute best talent or we have other metrics that that might matter. But yeah, I did not like as somebody who has a big audience, I knew there's going to be a ton of applications for this. It's a relatively simple role and you just killed it right out of the bat, like right out of the gate, right out of the bat. That's not an idiom. Is that the word idiom? Just now. Or aphorism? Uh, I mean, it is in what? Well, Big fight See, the, the thing comments. is, Go. I know these things until there's a question about it. And then suddenly what happens is I doubt everything I've ever known up to this point, just in case I'm wrong. All right. A an idiom is, is, is a group of words established by certain. usage as having a meaning not deducible from the individual words, e.g. raining cats and dogs. Uh, whereas an aphorism, not an aphrodisiac, a pithy observation that contains a general truth. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay, what did I say? Mm -hmm. Right out the bat, which is not an idiom, right. but it would have been an idiom is, if it is. Yeah, because so right out the gate a, is an idiom. decipherable. Yeah. Gotcha. Whereas like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The child is the father to the man is an aphorism. Interesting. There's a Ferris Bueller one. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop it and look around once in a while, you can miss it. Think about that. Chew on that for the rest of the day. Anyway, Whoa. yeah, sometimes you got to have Mr. Meeseeks as your Twitter profile, and then you just do some amazing work, and then you just get hired because how can they not ignore you? So that's the story behind our team. And then there's adjacent to the team, things like standard or agency. That's a whole nother story, but we're going to move on to the next question, which I don't know if I know how to answer. Question number four is what podcasts do you recommend now that we won't be getting new episodes of yours on smiley face? Uh, we'll see, um, uh, I'll tell you about my favorite podcasts. 
I I don't oh, necessarily good. have a podcast I can recommend to you, dear listeners, that is like this one. Um, unless I don't know if Ali Abdal is still doing his podcast. Uh, it's called Not Overthinking. So there's that one. I know people like the Knowledge Project from Shane Parrish from uh, Farnham Street. So go check those out. And I've always liked. I mean, this is not like a buddy podcast, but I've always liked uh, the Tim Ferriss podcast. He has a lot of very fascinating guests on. I think he's a good interviewer. He says fewer stupid things than Joe Rogan. So that could be an interesting one to look into. Uh, You like, there's one, Dear Hank and John, right? Uh, I don't listen to that one, but I do listen to the Anthropocene Reviewed. Is that also with those two? Is it? It's just John. It's like a monologue. Okay. Well, I think if you're looking for like a- Ashley listens to Dear Hank and John, and that's generally a QA and a format, so it's- yeah, I was going to say, Dear you know, Hank and John is probably like the, probably the thing I can fit. think of that's still running, I believe, that's like a two buddies kind of format. So that might be um, a good one to check out. Yeah. Um, my, my personal recommendation is silence. I actually spend a ton of my walks and my drives <laughs> with no music or anything. And a lot of my best thoughts that eventually come to this podcast did come from my thoughts in silence. That is true. If, if I have too much sound going on, I, I can drown out my chance at letting things percolate. For me, uh, music is identical to silence in that regard. Um, and I, I get a lot of ideas in the gym. Uh, also on the bike, they're they're easier to record when I'm in the gym. Uh, I think there's just something about physical activity and not listening to like content that does allow your brain I don't know. It's like it supercharges your brain, gets it moving, but also you have space to think. So yeah, I'll second that recommendation. Give yourself some silence or maybe some music and, and let your own thoughts, you know, kind of come out. Um, my favorite podcasts, the ones that I personally love, I'll recommend two. One is Hardcore History from Dan Carlin. Uh, he doesn't publish very often, but when he does, it's like a five hour long episode. So he's basically putting out audiobooks in the form of a podcast. They're excellent, you know, very well researched as far as I can tell from a non PhD historian's perspective. And then there's one from Wondery called Business Wars. And they'll do like multi part series where it's like, um, you know, Kellogg's versus uh, General Mills or Levi's versus Lee or uh, Ford versus uh chevy you know so it's like kind of a encapsulation of the growth of an industry but also like through the lens of two different companies who were competing at the time uh, blockbuster versus netflix so it's really well narrated it's got sound design well researched it's kind of like a story-ish like narrative podcast but i really like that one and then of course hardcore history is great too so those are the ones i would recommend um and then you know come back come back to the main channel uh, I think my friend Nathaniel Drew actually did kind of what we were talking about, this conversational format. He had a, a video or maybe two that came out recently where he talked to one of the guys from Yes Theory, and it literally is just like a long conversation. And he's actually done a few now that I think about it. He did one with his uh, his mother as well, which I think did pretty well. And then he, I think his most popular video is like speaking five different languages with my polyglot grandmother. So I think there actually is... Uh, room for long philosophical meandering conversation on YouTube. This week's episode is sponsored by our friends over at Brilliant, which is an amazing platform for increasing and improving your mastery in the areas of math, science, and computer science, but also becoming a better problem solver, becoming a person who is able to take novel problems and creatively figure out a solution that you might not know already. And as we talk about later in this episode, that is incredibly important, especially if you want to branch out into new areas and maybe even run your own business. Becoming an independent problem solver is, I think, one of the top prerequisites for being an entrepreneur. It's also very important for today's career field because as automation takes over more and more areas of our economy, the best jobs out there are the ones where you are required to take new problems that can't be solved easily by a computer or a computer alone and figure them out using your creativity. Brilliant is an excellent platform for building those skills while again, you improve your mastery in math, science, and computer science. They have an interactive library with more than 60 courses covering basically all of math 
or at least all of the math that most people are ever going to need from the basics of number theory and probability and statistics going all the way up to calculus, differential equations, things like that, math for quantitative trading and finance. And a lot of their math courses now have interactive content where you get even more hands on with the material. And that's kind of what Brilliant has always been about. It's about having active time to really wrangle with the material, solve bite sized problems that are logically sequenced so that you learn faster, but you're also using what you learn almost right away. And because Brilliant is structured in this way, it makes it a great complement to more traditional learning resources like classroom lectures or videos or books that you read. So in addition to that full math suite, you're also going to find science courses like their classical mechanics course, their gravitational physics course, and computer science classes, fundamentals of algorithms, the fundamentals of what makes search engines tick, even a Python programming course. So if you want to improve your mastery in these areas, if you want to improve your problem solving skills, you can go over to brilliant.org slash Inforium and sign up. And if you're one of the first 200 people to use that link, brilliant.org slash Inforium, you're even going to get 20% off your annual premium subscription. Big thanks as always to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode and being a huge supporter of our show for a very long time. And another big thanks this week goes out to Skillshare, another longtime supporter of our show and a great platform for learning tons of great skills that can improve your creativity and even your career prospects. There are thousands of classes on Skillshare covering video editing, graphic design, marketing, business analytics, tons of practical skills, including a few courses from yours truly. And the one that I want to promo this week is my class that I released this year, which is all about productivity for creatives. If you're somebody who does creative work, if you write, if you draw, if you make videos, if you make podcast episodes like this one, or even music, you know that productivity is a little different than when you have a task that's just very rote and you know the exact steps because you have to be creative. But I've learned throughout 10 years of being a creative is that getting yourself on a schedule and learning how to use your productivity muscles can actually improve your creative output and make it even more novel and interesting. And in my class, we go through the steps required to building that creativity muscle to setting yourself up to where you can actually produce on a schedule and doing things like getting rid of some of the friction, automating parts the process and even collaborating and adding people to your team. So if you are creative, I think you're going to get a lot out of this class. And because it's on Skillshare, you can actually take it for free because if you go over to Skillshare.com slash Inforium, you can actually get a free one month trial. So you can take as many classes as you want. You can get a ton of value out of the platform. And after that point, Skillshare is still a very affordable platform, one of the most affordable online learning platforms you're going to find out there. So if you go over to Skillshare.com slash Inforium, you can get that one month free trial. One more time, Skillshare.com com slash Inforium. And big thanks, as always, to Skillshare for being a very huge and longtime supporter of our show. Let's get back into it. So check those out. Uh, number five, I think we kind of already covered this, but will there be philosophical teachings on the YouTube channel? Yes, I think so. I think yep, we can, we can so. add those in there. Uh, number six, what are the basic financial steps that an 18 year old should take in order to set up an independent and stable financial future? Have I got an answer for you? Um, I'll put this in the show notes and uh, y'all like remind me to do this and link you to this if I don't. But I have something that I've been developing called the personal finance tech tree. So I spent a lot of time in my youth and also in relative non-youth playing games like uh, Civilization and Total Annihilation, like RTS games where there's often a tech tree. So it's like you got to learn agriculture and research that before you can move up to a uh, horse drawn carriage. And then you can, you know, move up to um, Calvary from that. And so it's like this whole progression of learning and unlocking different stages of a civilization's technological journey. Well, I view the individual and our journey into personal finance in the same way. Like there are things you need to do to set yourself up to do other things. So I've developed a literal tech tree, which I will link to you in Slack right now. So we don't forget to put it in there. And it kind of like maps out the steps I think most people should take to set themselves up for a solid financial future. Um, I just sent it to you in Slack right now. But in my opinion, there are kind of four main paths here. There's savings, there is regular income, there's uh, debt, and then there's budgeting. 
Budgeting is a pretty simple one. Learn how to budget your money, then learn how to do things like planning for your financial future and doing things like what if analyses. What if I bought this house? Would it be you know less per month than my current rent or not? What if I took this job? What if I took a pay cut? Those are pretty important to learn. Uh, the big things are getting rid of debt, building an emergency fund, and then starting to invest. So, you know, the biggest thing I would say is look at the tech tree. I've got a whole article and video that I've, that I'm working on. Um, and I'm hopefully going to get out at the beginning or mid of next month. I'm putting a lot of effort into this one on how to start investing, but yeah, the real, the real things are like establish that emergency fund. So you have, you have resources that you can put into use either when you need to, like you get a flat tire or when there's an opportunity, like you can hire your friend to build your website and gain more time to write blog posts. So, you know, have that emergency fund, then go from there, establish a cash buffer. So that would be like whatever your monthly expenses are, you'd want to have at least one month extra in the bank and try to get up to about three months extra in the bank if you can. And after that, uh, start investing, assuming you don't have high debt. Now, a lot of people do have high debt. They may have credit card debt. They may have student loan debt, may have car debt. Uh, In my opinion, If you have debt over 10%, you need to get rid of that immediately. And in many cases, you can consolidate and refinance that debt. So if you have credit card debt, you can often, I think you, did you do this at one point or did someone else do this? Somebody I know. I don't think I've ever. Maybe it was, maybe it was Andrew. Somebody I know used Lending Club to get, I believe a 7% interest loan to pay off credit card debt that was at like 25% interest, which is like a no brainer. And, uh, you know, once you've gotten the 10%, stuff done. Uh, at that point, you have a choice to make. I think there is tremendous psychological value to starting an investment account, just to say you've done it. Um, but if we look at the returns of the stock market over the past hundred or so years, the average return is around 7%. I'm sure the last 10 years have dragged that average up a little bit because the last 10 years, at least in the U S market have been insane. Um, but if you look at like 100 years, it's like 7%. So when we're looking at investing from a very long-term perspective, we can say, you know, if we have a moderately aggressive portfolio that is weighted towards stocks, but well diversified across all of the stocks, pretty much like an index fund, we can expect 7% on average. So what I say is cool. Let's take that 7%. Let's be a little bit conservative and chop off 2%. So we have an even five. If I've got debt over 5%, I should probably kill that debt first. That's that's what I think should be done. So if I've got like a, a student loan of six percent, I I would like to destroy that if I can as fast as possible. If I've got my mortgage at three percent, I'm not going to pay any more than the minimum because any extra that I would pay down on my mortgage would probably, you know, we're we're making a bet here again. This is all a little bit of gambling, but probably perform better in the market long term. And then uh, you know, set it up as an automated investment and forget it prioritize your retirement accounts because money grows a lot faster when it's not being eaten away by taxes. And uh, yeah, set it up, be disciplined, consistently commit, and then keep learning, keep becoming more capable, invest in yourself. You know, whether that means starting a business or going back to school or learning a, a marketable skill in your free time that you don't have to pay thousands of dollars to a college to acquire. And, you know, yeah, invest in yourself, invest in your own income potential, but also invest in your health, invest in your relationships, uh, both to improve both of them over time, but also as a hedge towards, uh, you know, unforeseen events. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a lot of good stuff. I guess if you're 18, the only, uh, you, you might be looking at college in which case choose your major wisely with a bunch of those, what if analyses, Mm, because, you know, it's a very important legal document to sign if you're going to get a student loan. And yeah, I did it knowing what the average outcome, average employment was for the major I chose, Mm -hmm. what the payments would look like, what my pay would look like given the average income, et cetera. Because, you know, that's, it's one of the most important, it's a fairly important document to have to sign when you're only 18, Mm -hmm. but you do sign it in that case. So you should definitely be thorough. Do your due diligence. This is very true. Yeah, we kind of I don't expect regret college that, like, at all, but I planned it like that. When we're going to college, we kind of expect the society is like got our best interests in mind. 
Uh, and that's not always the case, especially when it comes to private student loans, expensive private colleges, or going to college for something that isn't a marketable skill, you know? And you can make the argument all day long that, oh, you know, any degree, regardless of what it is, has signaling value, but I don't know if the statistics well, actually prove that. I know I've talked about this before, but my major when I went to Iowa State was going to be French first because that's what I wanted to learn. Until before classes even started, like during orientation, I was like, what does a French degree give me that speaking French doesn't? Mm -hmm. I'm going to change my major. And then I changed it to MIS, knowing that MIS will get me the jobs that I want to pay for the loans that I will need to go to college and learn French. Like mm -hmm. it was a deal. I made a deal with myself because yep. I knew that the first one would have been loans that I now don't know how to pay off very well and would have been annoyed by for a long time. And uh, can confirm MIS in terms of four-year degrees is a top-tier degree, especially Fairly when you're useful. talking about business degrees. Actually, there's a guy on YouTube. His name is uh, Shane Hummus, and he does tier lists of college majors. So he did a video, uh, the business major tier list, and I went in there with an expectation and he did not disappoint. An S tier was MIS. And I believe the only other one in S tier was uh, economics. Economics is an interesting degree because when you look at it on the surface, you're like, well, how many economists do we really need? But there's actually research to show that uh, among all the college majors, economics majors are the ones who have the ability to creatively solve problems that they don't already know the solution to. And I don't know, like the sample size of that study. I think it was referenced in David Epstein's book, Range. So something about economics that just helps you be a more critical and adaptive thinker. So economics can actually be a very useful major, even more useful when it is paired with a more uh, immediately applicable major such as MIS or accounting. Um, but yeah, MIS is a very practical major. It gives you broad experience over several different areas that have a lot of employability right out the gate. Uh, we learned, uh, we learned networking fundamentals. We learned database. We learned project management. We learned programming. I think those are like kind of the four. It's, it's like paths. half business, half software mm -hmm. engineer, essentially. Yep. So yeah, you also learn basic accounting, you learn which combine and business do, stuff you know, too. every business today is involved in both business and probably technology. So it's a mm -hmm. fairly yeah, I think wide if you, range you get a pull from. If you go into MIS and you do an internship and you, uh, you know, try to get some on-campus jobs or get some kind of practical experience in tech, getting a job is easy. You go into, you know, I'll pick one that seems equally practical. You go into marketing, that might be a bit harder. Unless, you know, there's a lot of job opportunity out there for marketers, but not necessarily just for somebody who learned the four P's and read a couple of case studies about uh, method soap being in target. You know, a lot of the yeah. marketing that I see people looking for is like, do you have technical marketing experience? Do you have like a data science background? Can you like, are you a complete ninja with the Facebook ads platform or that kind of thing? And you know, maybe they've updated the curriculum, but I do not remember seeing any of that kind of technical marketer stuff in the curriculum when I was evaluating that as a potential major. Yeah, I'm not sure at that point in time, especially. But yeah, you mm -hmm. know, like the all of the all of the general financial education is going to be important, and the very nearest biggest decision you'll probably be making deserves some of that research. Yeah, just to just to be and and you can totally take one that's like going to pay off the loan slow if you've decided the happiness you get from the job is worth mm -hmm. having to lug around that debt it's just that like y you need to know what you're getting into that way you're not mad later you got to also ask yourself like do i need a four year degree to do what i want to do yeah you i don't need a four year degree to do this i could have i could have got a job after community college yep. with the degree that i got the associate's degree that would have been fine yeah i mean you could have gone to uh i'm not gonna like tacitly endorse these but you could have gone to a coding boot camp or you could have just like learned a ton of code on your own or you could have gone to a two-year program the one thing i do like about community college is they they're not so high and mighty about this liberal arts education where you're like also paying 300 dollars per credit hour to learn about ethics you know i can i can read ethics textbooks <laughs> on my own for free um I can read, uh, you know, some stoicism on my own for free and then I can pay 
for the practical education that's going to translate directly to career earnings. And yeah. community college is much more focused on that. You know, and there, there, there's like a, a lot of downplaying in our society on the value of things like, you know, learning how to weld or learning how to fix HVAC. Like those are great career options that can pay pretty well. I remember we had a, I can't remember if this was in my community college when I was doing the dual credit thing in high school or in high school itself. We had a guy who represented like a sheet metal workers association come in and do a presentation. And he's like, you guys know, like you can get this certification, you can go to this program and you're making over 50 K a year after two years of education. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are totally blowing this off because they see it as blue collar work. They see it as, you know, not going to be high income. You're making more money doing this than probably half the four-year degree starting salaries. So it's worth, I don't know, we just have a lot of assumptions in our society and it's worth looking into alternative paths yeah. and seeing, you know, what can you get out of them? Uh, so yeah, there there's a lot of extra detail on, uh, well, I mean, I, to, be, to be fair, it wasn't a very simple question. Like you did ask for basic financial steps for an 18 year old, but there's, there's kind of a lot to learn, you know? Yeah. Um, the other I, the thing very is, basic uh, steps are get money, get money. Yep. That's it. Save it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> we expand it a little bit, uh, learn how to use debts intelligently. So, you know, that means evaluating whether or not I should take that student loan. Is this even worth it? But also it might mean getting a credit card. Uh, if you're 18, I think these days, the easiest way to get a credit card is going to be getting a secured one where you put down some, uh, collateral payment and then your limit is that payment basically. So, and I've had people ask me like, is that, doesn't that make it a debit card? It's not a debit card because if you have a debit card, you're literally paying with money out of your bank account with a secured credit card. Let's say you have a $500 limit. You pay $500 and that is collateral against your line of credit, but then you're using the line of credit as if it were a regular credit card, you're paying it off. And in the event that you don't pay, then they may use that collateral to pay it off. So it, um, it lowers the potential downside for the credit card company because you don't have credit history for them to use in underwriting. But it's also a great way for you to build credit in a situation where they might not otherwise give you a credit card or they might ask you for a cosigner. And, you know, cosigning is a very risky thing. So a lot of people don't want to do it, which is totally understandable because you're literally betting your credit worthiness on someone else being responsible. Uh, but if you do that, then my recommendation, a uh, very hard recommendation here is, you know, credit cards are very useful, but you have to treat them as simply an intermediary step between you and your bank account. If you want to buy something and you have a credit card, make sure you could buy it with your debit card. And if you can, then what you've essentially done is you're using your evolving line of credit to build credit, increase your credit score, maybe even accrue some awards like, a, you know, miles or cash back, but then you're never paying a cent of interest. And you're never risking going into debt and getting into a financially unstable situation. Yeah. And your liability for like, if somebody steals your card, your credit card and spends it is, yep. you don't, you don't have to do, you don't have to deal with that. Like it'll just, mm -hmm. you just say, Hey, this was fraud. Yeah. And if, then minus it. If you can be disciplined. I've had that happen a few times. Yeah, I have too. Um, if you can be disciplined and responsible with a credit card, it is a financial superpower. Uh, you know, there, there is one caveat to make, which is I, I do believe there's research around this. And I think uh, personally, I've experienced this when you aren't using cash or the more um, removed you are from your own money in terms of layers of abstraction, you may be encouraged subconsciously to spend more. It's easier to pull a credit card out than it is to pull out cash and literally watch your money leaving your hands to buy things. So it may change your spending habits. If you're worried about that, then I would recommend manual budgeting. Um, you can use, I think you used to use an app called Daily Budget, right? Yep, yep, little piggy bank icon on iOS. So there's that one. Uh, there's also, I have looked up a lot of reviews and I have not tried this myself, but everyone says the best budgeting software is you need a budget, YNAB. Uh, it does cost like, eight bucks a month or something. So it's, it does cost you money to use it. Yeah, but, I've definitely never used it. Um, from what I've like, I, I've read a lot of Reddit threads because at one point I was like, maybe I should try budgeting myself just to see what it's like. And everyone's like, YNAB is the best. I've tried them all, YNAB's the will best. It, will it make me rich? I, I mean, it might. 
if it influences your habits and encourages you to to save more money every month, then yeah, maybe it will. I don't know. There's a lot of fast food out there that does not want me to save my money. <laughs> so conflict of interest. Those are cheap calories, man. I mean, hey, depending on your uh, your view on what rich is. Eh. <laughs> yeah. Then again, you could just eat like rice and eggs and soy sauce. And that's that's like the cheapest that calories. That does sound delicious. Um, but yeah, like the, the guy who wrote A Random Walk Down Wall Street, which I would recommend for people who want to gain a better understanding of investing. Uh, he said the, the most important thing toward building wealth is your savings rate. So it's, you know, time in the market to allow your savings to grow, but it's also just having the discipline and having the income required to be able to save a decent amount of money. I think I did the math on this. Like the other day I did the math on this. If you put a dollar in the market, and you get that cool 7% rate of return, you leave it in there for 40 years, you're going to have like 14 bucks at the end of it, which is pretty cool. Like your $1 turned into $14, 14x doubling rate or 14x, like it's pretty huge, but it's still a dollar. And so now you have 14 bucks. So cool, your dollar now buys you like, well, it's 40 years of inflation. So it buys you, I don't know, uh, half a box like of Mike a, and Ike's. A, 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 sm- a, small, a <laughs> small black coffee. Small black coffee, uh, you know, so you got to be getting to the point where you can live below your means and save the difference. Um, and I started this out with, uh, I think it was like a hundred bucks a month. And then I think we said this early in the episode. Uh, at one point I was like 1500 a month. And I remember um, reading Pete Adney's story, Mr. Money Mustache, how he and his wife had quote unquote retired by the age of 30. And the way they did this is they used the 4% rule which is this rule in personal finance, uh, which is a highly contested rule, I will say. Uh, but the, the, the simple, I guess what we'll, we'll say high school physics level math checks out. And by high school physics, I mean, we're not, we're not considering air resistance here. So when you do your physics calculations in high school, you're like, cool, you know, it's, uh, I can do my force calculation by just taking FMA. Who cares about air resistance? Um, it's that kind of thing. So 4% rule is like, if I, take 4% of the value of my portfolio out every year as living expenses, the portfolio should never lose money because we're using that 7% rate of return in the market and then being conservative and saying we're going to get between 4 and 5% on average if we build a more diversified portfolio that is more resistant to market shocks. Cool. So, you know, saying I'm making 5% a year on that, if I take out 4%, I got a percent left over in growth. Should last me forever. That's the general theory behind it. Again, we're saying no air resistance here because it doesn't really account for 2008 when the yeah. value of your portfolio plunges by 50%. And then, you know, at that point, you take your 4% out. Well, you've taken out a lot at a loss. And that may mean when it recovers, it doesn't recover to the level it was at. So that's like the big thing you have to consider with the 4% rule. I would like to do an article about this at some point because there's more research to do. But anyway, they did this. And they were like, okay, you know, we can live fairly uh, frugally. And if we, I I can't remember what their exact numbers are, but I'm going to go with what I think they were. If we save up around $900,000, that means using the 4% rule, we can live off of 36K. And if we, you know, buy a cheap house or maybe even build one and we pay it off, then we don't have a car, then that's easy. That's like over $3,000 a month to live off of, or maybe it's like right around $3,000. so I was like 23 and I went, that, that sounds awesome. I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I'm gonna retire till like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna retire at 40 and did the math on that. And I think it ended up uh, being that to hit that same level of $900,000 in a portfolio. So I could live off of 36 K a year, which I thought, you know, in Iowa easy, it would be around 22 to $2,300 a month. I'd need to invest. Um, so that's kind of where I set my sights and talked about this on the Listen Money Matters podcast, just kind of offhandedly, somehow got on the news about it, <laughs> I guess. Oh, yeah. If Fox News was like, it was like Fox Business, and they were like, oh, this 23-year-old is going to retire by 40. I guess it was a clickbaity headline, but I'm like, yeah, it's, it's just 4% rule. I just have a savings goal, basically. Uh, and and the, the retire there is in quotes, because what it really means is I would like to build my portfolio up to the point where... I have the option, if I so choose, to live off of the income. Uh, It is not I have 
you know, actively plan to stop working by 40 and then I'm going to go sit on a beach in Maui and drink Mai Tais because I would get bored in about five minutes. I have done this before. Do get bored in about five minutes. Um, it's more about optionality. And, you know, since then I realized, well, my lifestyle has expanded. I have a fiance now, may have a family one day, may have parents to take care of one day. So you start to realize as you get older, and I think I realized this earlier on, but as you get older, they're like, there are extra expenses that you probably didn't plan for when you're a 23 year old single guy. So I save even more now. And at this point, it's more just like, well, what are the limits for my retirement accounts? Let's make that the goal. Try to hit those limits and, you know, make those limits as high as possible. So I do things like now I have a, a solo 401k set up, which means I can save more than I would have if it was just an IRA. So yeah, just never stop learning. Never stop growing. Be more capable. Yeah. Um, and you just set up your IRA. I'm so I did happy. do that. Virtual fist bump. I'm now a millionaire. They just, the moment you open a Roth IRA, millionaire. Yep. That's how it this works. This is actually, uh, doctors hate this one trick. I don't know why doctors hate it. I don't know <laughs> why I chose doctors. <laughs> doctors hate this one trick that uh, they have nothing to it. say about. They don't care. Here we go. Financial advisors hate this one trick where you do this like cool McFlippy twist on a skateboard that uh, actually like teaches you somehow through the ether when you land it that uh 97 of active money managers do not beat the market and they charge high fees so what you do is you go to fidelity or vanguard or m1 finance and you open up a roth ira and then you get either a very simple portfolio where you just invest in an index fund uh like the vanguard total stock market index fund etf or maybe like a three fund portfolio so you could add in some bonds and some international diversification but if you're young you mostly go into stocks and then you set up an automatic investment and you max out your roth ira that's what you do and then you pay almost nothing in fees and you end up beating most of the financial advisors out there all right <laughs> there it is okay uh next question how hard is it For you to take this decision, the decision that we're quitting, considering the fact that you have had this show on for more than seven to eight years, what questions arise in your mind while taking or making this decision? My heart, she is broken. (laughs) No, I'm fine. Is this what it means to cry? Um, You know, this was an era, but I've always seen life as, as a series of chapters. I think you taught me that actually that specific verbiage. I like to I like to I like to look at things like that. I'm actually pretty excited to have a new chapter just because I don't know what's going to be in it yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's it's going to feel weird. I've been podcasting for 8 years. You've been podcasting for nearly as long uh cuz you were on like episode 20 or something like that when we started. But, you know, I I also went to school for a long time and graduated and that felt weird, but I realized this is a yeah. new chapter, new opportunities, time for new adventures. And that's what excites me. I also realize like I'm not completely shutting the door here. I've got the mic. I know how to make a podcast. If I ever wanted to do it again, I could. Um, you know, and I'm still making content on the YouTube channel. There's actually quite a lot of similarities there. So does it feel weird? Yes. But I, I think we kind of answered this question in a lot of detail in the last episode, talking about the dip. When you realize, hey, I've got a lot of things going on. There are certain things I want to prioritize. I want to be great at these things. What do I need to do in order to achieve that? Well, I need to give myself time and focus and ability to concentrate. And the only way to do that is to pare down the number of things I'm focusing on. Yeah. So that's kind of... You can't prioritize without deprioritizing something. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Next one. Loads of people want to start a business nowadays, but many don't have a business idea. They fall in love with the idea of owning a business rather than actually doing it. What would you say to those people? Is it best to find the idea first or is the entrepreneur mindset more important? Um, two things I'll say here. Number one, I remember a conversation I had with my college roommate who was majoring in computer science, but was not putting the work in and just did not seem interested in learning the basics of Java programming. Um, and I think he had like failed a semester and then it was redoing it again. And it was struggling again with that semester. And we did a couple of things. We ran a degree audit, which is a what if analysis for your college degree 
wherein I realized, and this was hilarious to me, that he was further into my major going through his major's prerequisites than his own major. Because yeah, MIS has day. some overlap with computer science, or I think it was computer engineering. Um, so we realized, oh my gosh, if you switched, you would literally be ahead. The other thing is, let me ask you a question. Do you actually care about tinkering with computer hardware? Do you care about logic gates? Do you care about Java programming? Do you care about recursive algorithms? Or do you not want to quit because you're afraid of how your parents are going to think? You're afraid of the sunk cost fallacy? And did you go into this major in the first place because you kind of wanted to be like tank for the matrix and just be the guy in the chair with all the monitors and the code coming down? And he goes, yeah, I think it was the kind of that one. So switch his major. Boom, magically ahead of where he was now taking coursework that he was more interested in and was more capable at doing and everything worked out just fine. So yeah, doing well. That is one anecdote that I think applies here. A lot of people want to live the life that they see on Instagram. They want to say, I have my own business. They want to have the schedule, but they don't necessarily understand what being an entrepreneur actually entails. And if you don't have an idea, then you're never going to, you know, you're never going to actually experience those other parts of the entrepreneurial lifestyle. Um, let me answer this question more directly by talking about how I got into being an entrepreneur. My first job ever was wheeling my, my dad's lawnmower around town, knocking on doors and asking if I could mow lawns. And I got a couple of clients that way. Uh, and then I took a few part-time jobs. I was a cashier. I worked in a bakery. I worked at Target. Uh, the worst job I ever had was being a sample person in Target because I cannot stand still and stare at a wall for even 30 seconds. I need to be working. Did a bunch of those. Uh, and then I also in college and I think near the end of high school, I started this, started doing freelance web design. So I had this entrepreneurial spirit, I think before I even had the idea. But I wasn't sure. I wasn't like, I know I will be an entrepreneur. In fact, I remember in high school learning about how uh, <laughs> when, you, when you're an entrepreneur, you have to do your taxes yourself. And that seemed so intimidating to me. And I was like, oh, if I do it wrong, if I give him one typo, the IRS is going to come to my door and take me away to jail forever. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, actually. If you do one typo, even one, solitary can find for the rest of your life in IRS jail. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> Actually, a piece of advice I've been, I've been given by other entrepreneurs. Uh, when you are an entrepreneur, if you are aggressive with the things you expense, they may audit you and they may make you pay the taxes that you didn't pay. But if you hide your income like Wesley Snipes did, that's when you go to prison. So hashtag not legal advice, but that's what I've heard from several entrepreneurs actually. Uh, anyway, so I was, I was scared. I'm like, I'm just going to go be an employee somewhere because I don't, I don't know how to do this. Uh, and then, you know, the interest came back because I started this freelance web design business. And then all it takes is a, a couple hours of Googling around, reading articles on NOLO, realizing, oh, hey, actually dealing with expenses and taxes as an entrepreneur is really not that hard, especially now that there's stuff like QuickBooks or Xero that can take all your expenses and help you categorize them. And then there's stuff like TurboTax where they literally will do the taxes for you, even if you're self-employed, like they've made it easy. Yeah. So, you know, that hurdle out of the way, I then have this idea. I could make websites. I got a business doing websites. If my friends need some code, who do they call? Weird Al. And, uh, you know, kind of just go along with it. So I think you kind of need both. You need like the spark of the, I want to do things on my own, but you also need an idea where you're like, Hey, I could actually do that. There's a marketable idea there. And then you just, you go yeah. and you, you commit to it and you try it out. It's a bet. You put in the effort and you learn. Yeah. And if you want those ideas, you should probably be spending a lot of time exploring new areas, new skill sets, new communities of people with different needs. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you'll be in the right place at the right time and you'll have the right thought and you'll see that could be solved using something I know how to do because I've tried it before. But if you sit at home just waiting for the perfect entrepreneurial business idea to show up, you don't learn any new skills, you don't make any new connections, you're not gonna have a lot to grow an idea from. Yeah, that's very true. It, 
you're not going to sit here and then think I know how to be rich tomorrow. Like you, you got to be out living life. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes the idea just pops in your head out of nowhere and you're like, Oh God, I need a notebook. Oh wait, we have smartphones now. That's not actually a thing you might think, but you'll write it down. No, but you do need one though. You remember that, that analog productivity system that went on Kickstarter and raised like a million bucks. It's literally just note cards, the, but like fancy. the index cards. Yeah. But they're fancy yeah. and they're in a brushed they walnut container. So they will make you more productive. Especially nice. if you uh, are you know, a productivity YouTuber, because then you can make a what's on my desk video and film said walnut card holder in 20, 120 frames per second slow mo and make people want to be like you through parasocial relationships. Yeah. That's definitely not the most cynical thing I ever said. <laughs> no, don't maybe worry people it. get use Just, out uh, of it. And maybe, and maybe. To, to, to take the opposite tack here. Maybe it's okay if you want to spend the money to have beautiful, high quality things that you use to get your work done. Even if you could if just motivated. write your to-do list down on a 50 cent sticky note instead and get the same technical utility. It's like people who wear watches. My, my uh, agent, like he will buy tens of thousands of dollar watches. And I'm like, it tells the time. This tells the time. This does more. The Apple watch does way more because it tracks on my fitness and everything, but it makes him happy. And it makes him, I don't know, I think it makes him like feel more confident and want to work harder. So that's okay. If it motivates you, it might actually be worth it in the end to get something that seems overpriced. Yep. But also realize that what I just said is often weaponized as a sales tactic. You need to mm -hmm. buy this watch so you'll take it seriously. You need to buy the fancy car so your back is against the wall and you have to go make that sale. Is that true? Or is that marketing hype? I'll let you decide that. I mean, I actually do have a real estate agent friend who said, you know, bought the fancy car, so I would have to go make the sale. Maybe that's true. But it's also true that that sentiment is used as a sales tactic. You know, I've literally, like this pisses me off. Uh, there's like a, clip coffeezilla put it up recently of grant cardone being like you know if if somebody's asking uh, i'm down to my last my last hundred dollars should i invest it in this course we're running and i say the answer is hell yeah like that's irresponsible but it's using the exact same sales tactic there you got to put your back against the wall and, and make sure that your head is in it so i don't know it's it, it frustrates yeah. me um the last thing i'll say here though though is like Make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. If you want to get into business, if you want to be an entrepreneur, it's kind of like being a YouTuber. There's a lot of people who want to make the money. They want to live the lifestyle. But if that's the only thing fueling you, you're never going to get to that point because building a business or building a content business has a lot of shit work. You're going to be spending late nights up editing. You're going to be tearing your hair out because Premiere crashed for the 15th time and you can't figure out why and you can't even open your project or you just spent two hours writing up a blog post and then for some reason WordPress hiccuped and you lost your draft and everything is gone. Like there's a lot of crap moments and there's a lot of just super difficult work for which you're going to get very little reward in the short term. And the only thing that's going to fuel you is passion for that thing, for your idea and your work ethic. Because it takes a long time to get to the point where there actually are material rewards. Um, Noah Kagan did a talk at FinCon a couple of years ago where, uh, so for context, Noah Kagan is a guy who has uh, formed a few different businesses. I think his current business is called Sumo. They make a lot of money, uh, but he was like employee number seven at Facebook and then quit Facebook and uh, got onto the team at Mint dot com. He was one of the very first people on the team at Mint. He was their first marketing hire and then built Sumo. And he overlaid a graph of what his income would have looked like had he stayed at Facebook versus the income of his business. And there was like a period of seven years where he would have made way more money staying at Facebook, taking that salary, taking the stock options, all that kind of stuff. He would have been very wealthy. Employee number seven at Facebook. But there's a point at which maybe seven years later, the income from his own business that he owns finally meets that linear or at least more linear graph from the Facebook employee income and then just rockets past it 
It's like that classic hockey stick a graph. So yeah, the rewards for taking the risk and running his own business, you know, could have crashed into the ground too, but in his case, were very, very great, but took a long time to get there. There's a lot of late nights, a lot of grunt work, a lot of time spent thinking, man, I could be making a lot more money if I had stayed at Facebook right now. So you got to be willing to believe in your vision and you got to be willing to gamble a little bit, make a bet on yourself and then be willing to put in the work for quite a long time before you're going to see the rewards. That's how you do it. All right. Uh, number nine, favorite to do app still using to doist. What are you doing? What are you using? I Peter? have everything in a, it's an obsidian notes because oh. they have this daily note feature mm -hmm. and I literally just type, I have like a work and personal task little section. I just write out little checklists every day. Sometimes I do them all. Sometimes I don't. And if they're important, I will remember it the next day, go back to the old one, cut it and paste it into the new day's note. And if it's not important, it will probably just get forgotten in the stack somewhere. Okay. I like a system that allows things to delete themselves essentially from my, my mind. So I'm just... I'm not concerned with having a large task bank. Uh, I don't have so many tasks right now that I wouldn't naturally remember mm -hmm. that I benefit from having a larger task bank system. So it's just a, literally the same function as every day pulling out a new page on my notebook and just writing down today's tasks. Cool. What about recurring tasks? Like uh, remembering to pay your quarterly taxes. Recurring tasks, I guess... I don't have a system for that right now. I just sort of do them. Did you remember That's to pay your taxes on How time? Am I doing that? I do everything on time right now. I oh. don't know. You know, I guess I've done it. Good job, Martin. I've, you, I, if I have more recurring tasks than I can remember, I will probably put those down somewhere. I do not know where that would be gotcha. right now. Cool. Uh, well, I'm using notion. Uh, I built a template called ultimate tasks and it's free. You can get it on my website, thomasjfrank.com slash notion. Um, but I don't think notion is the best task management system. Like if you just want to manage tasks, Todoist is great. Uh, Microsoft to do is great. iOS reminders is great. Does it yeah. have an area where you can easily and quickly get a task down? And then, you know, does it have some nice things like, I do think recurring tasks are good and subtasks are nice and like reminders can be useful. Uh, one thing that I do like about iOS reminders, which I, I do use this for certain things, they have geofenced reminders. So like I received an Ikea gift card for Christmas last year, but I'm like, I don't know the next time I'm going to go to Ikea and I have a tiny wallet. So uh, I'm just going to keep the email with the code, but I know like, my life's chaotic. I'm going to go to Ikea. I'm going to forget that I had this. And iOS reminders has the geofence thing. So I have a thing set up where if I go to Ikea, I can set a circle around it. that's like almost as small as the building itself. And I'll get the reminder on my phone. Hey, you have a gift card only when I go there. So that's pretty nice. That is pretty cool. But yeah, for the most part, I just use my ultimate tasks thing. It's got an inbox. It's got the today, next seven days, all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah. Number 10. What are some ways that you measure productivity now at the end of the Enforium versus when you started CIG? Interesting question. Uh, you know, when I started CIG, I was in college. So I kind of measured productivity on both my grades, but also like the growth of the business. Um, I think I was, well, you know, I'm trying to think of like how I was back then versus how I am now. And in terms of like the way that I measure productivity and measure a lot of things, it's it's not been so much like a huge change over time as it's been an ebb and flow. And I almost feel like I'm sort of back in a position that's similar to how I was in college where I'm doing a lot more sort of quantified self stuff. So like we're back to using Beeminder for the channel and, you know, making sure we have a, a good publishing schedule. Um, right now I'm actually doing an experiment where I'm tracking my food using my fitness pal, just cause I want to see like, what do I actually eat? I want to see what happens if I track. Um, I'm you, I love my Apple watch cause I've been tracking my fitness every day and making sure I close all my rings. So there's like some database productivity markers that I'm using and I have overall goals kind of like 
I did when I started with the impossible list, like I uh, just hit my thousand pound powerlifting goal. So the next one is going to be 1200 pounds. Um, and I, you know, I think beyond that though, when I was in college, I very much did not have my life figured out yet. It was like, what am I going to do? What kind of job am I going to end up with? I have no idea. So that was like the, you know, hit all these performance markers that the world tells you to hit so you can be in a position to be successful, get good grades, do all the extracurriculars, uh, get an internship, all this kind of stuff. And now it's like, well, I have this business and I know what I want to do with it at this point. I've got a good direction. So the markers are, are we pushing forward in the direction that we want to go? And uh, in conjunction with that and being balanced with that, are we living the lives we want to live? Do we have balance? Do I have time for exercise, time with my fiance, time with friends? <laughs> Am I sleeping eight hours a night? I want to live a balanced life. You know, I don't want to yeah. be putting in all-nighters. Yeah, I would say that that's actually the biggest change for me. Cause I'm still, you know, I've still got the, some things that are worth tracking habit wise, just to get me into things. I'm going to be more serious about exercise in August. I was planning on just cause I like, I like August as a starting over thing. Cause it, you know, lines up with school, which I always found motivating, mm. but should go back to school. It's just that, yeah, I'll, I'll just go get myself a billion dollar loan right now <laughs> and go do that. No, I, I still got habits to track sometimes. Sometimes I choose not to and I take a break. It, that isn't all that different. The difference is just that now I measure my success differently based on how often am I calm and in the moment and enjoying my life. And I know that this won't lead to laziness because if I'm not accomplishing the things that I need to, I can't feel calm. Right. I will sit around and stew in anxiety I can't play games because I'm not free. I can't work because I'm stressed. I can't go outside. Be like if I'm doing nothing, I won't be calm. Mm. But if I am meeting all the other requirements and I have a part of my day where I'm just like, you know what? I kind of want to go for a walk and then I just do it. That is me succeeding mm. because being able to follow a whim like that and feeling like I have earned the time to do it and nothing's going to go wrong. That is success for me. That's the life I want to live. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. I want to be able to do what I want to do. And the way I think about productivity is, okay, I have set up my constraints. I know that I want to say play tennis later today with Tony. I want to be able to hang out with Anna. I need to really hit it hard during my work hours because I have deadlines. I have goals and I also have a hard stop. So make it work. Put in the work. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. How do you avoid becoming obsessed with productivity? I find myself feeling terrible if an activity I do cannot be measured by some metric and I'm trying to find balance between productivity and living. <laughs> so somebody else on Twitter said uh, that we still struggle with this. That's like obvious because of how we talk on the show. So I don't know. Are we actually qualified to answer a question like this? But I, I think you kind of just did. Like you literally just said, I view... If I want to take a walk and I do as a win, yeah, that seems pretty healthy to me. Yeah. Well, actually an example from just this morning. So I, during the, the whole extra hard pandemic times going to the cafe was like the only cool thing I could do. So that paired with bad sleep and tons of other things and, and, and ebbs and flows of depression and grief and things at some point. I came to rely on coffee when I had never been a coffee drinker before I was drinking like three or four things a day and my sleep was getting messed up. So this month I was like, for the first 21 days, I will not drink coffee. I did the first 19 cold Turkey, no problem. And this morning it felt nice outside. And I was like, you know, what seems really like cozy this morning coffee, but not in a, I need to wake up way. I feel fine. I just, I think it would go well with the weather outside. So then I decided it's the 20th. And my goal was to cut the reliance. And I did that. So I don't care about today's checkbox because I've completed the purpose of the productivity. The, the habit tracker was for a reason, not to prove I can fill checkboxes, but to kill the reliance on coffee, which I did easily for 19 straight days. And I now wake up fine and I sleep fine and everything's better. Mm. It's a... Uh, 
but I, the purpose behind the productivity needs to be set. So, you know, whether you've met it, the check boxes aren't the point. Yeah. Well, like the, I have like a duality going on in my head right now. Cause part of me is like, Oh, but you should have stuck to the 21 days. So you do what you said you're going to do. I just didn't care. But I, I definitely I, get the other side of it as well. Cause you know, what if you had said, I'm going to go a year without coffee and you realize like at, at a certain point, okay, this is dumb. I just, I committed. I don't to intend to have any coffee tomorrow. Yeah. You know, it was just because today it felt particularly something in the air reminded me of fall. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I want a delicious, warm, cozy drink. Yeah. And that was it. I don't have any intention of drinking coffee again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'll get that last checkbox, but missing one because it felt like the thing I wanted to do in that point, that was more important to me than hundred percenting actually trying to 100% my productivity goals. If they're the less important ones is bad for me because yeah. the ones that I should be 100 percenting are the very serious goals that Matt, me not having coffee today didn't, nothing really changes. That doesn't hurt me. But if I never start exercising again, or I betray my financial goals, there are actual things that I will, that, that will hurt me mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you've talked a lot about how chasing complete purity can become toxic. You talked about this a lot. Particularly when you have OCD, like I do, I, yeah. I, I intentionally break purity sometimes because otherwise I seek it in an unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. And I think that w with or without OCD, it is easy to start revering purity and perfection as a thing you can do. Perfectionism is common in people without OCD too. It's mm -hmm. so I intentionally break it sometimes just to say, see, nothing bad happened. Yep. As long as you did it mostly. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing I'll say here is, uh, I want to kind of like construct a little bit of a thought experiment. So, uh, recently, I think we talked about this, but I also talked about it in my regrets of my twenties video. I talked about how we have priorities and some of these priorities are tangible and easily measurable number of followers you have, how much money you have. Uh, some of these priorities are not easily measurable and they're not very tangible. Like what's your relationship like with your significant other? How often do you talk to your mom? Like that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, how often do you take time for yourself just to be alone with your thoughts? And when you sit down and you think about this from the perspective of, okay, I'm 40 years old. What do I look back on and regret? It, it, it's pretty easy when you go into that frame of mind to think, well, I would regret not spending more quality time with my fiance. And, you know, I don't think I would care too much about whether I got 20,000 followers or 21,000 followers. Like it's pretty easy to have that kind of removed sober mindset when you think about these things in terms of what would I regret when I'm older. But in the moment, the tangibility and the measurability of things with metrics get very tempting. And I think that, you know, this focus on tangibility is what can create these feelings of guilt when you're doing something that doesn't have a productivity metric attached to it. So literally do this exercise for yourself. Write out your priorities, maybe even make a mind map so you can, you can figure out like the areas of your life where you want to focus, physical health, mental health, your learning, your goals, your relationships with people you love, you know, how social you are. Are you going out and meeting new people? Whatever it is you want to improve in, list out priorities and goals you have in these areas. And then ask yourself, if I'm like 40 years old, 50 years old, and I'm looking back, what are the ones I regret if I didn't do them? I think you're going to start to realize a lot of them are the ones that are less tangible. They aren't so based on quantified self metrics. Maybe some of them are going to be in the quantified self area, but a lot of them, I think the important ones are going to be, you know, I spent more time with the people I cared about. I made time for myself. I lived a balanced life. You know, maybe some of them are like, I yeah. put out more music, like I said, but a lot of them are going to be intangible. And when you realize that, I think it's going to be easier to allow yourself to do these things because now you'll remember I sat down and, and admitted to myself, these are the things of highest priority. Even if I can't measure them very easily, they're what matter. And because of that, there's no reason for me to feel guilty that I'm not going and getting, you know, 500 extra steps on my Apple watch right now or publishing yet another article so I can hit four per week or whatever it is, because this, this matters more. Yeah. 
And if you find yourself in the opposite area where you're, you're just kind of obsessing with these metrics, ask yourself, what am I, what am I sacrificing right now? There's always an opportunity cost. What is it right now? You know, if I spent uh, two hours every morning responding to my Instagram DMs, I might be able to say, yeah, I responded to 30 DMs right now, but I skipped out on having a conversation with my fiance this morning or going and playing tennis with Tony. Skipped out on those. I would have cared about those more. You probably won't remember the Instagram DMs in like 30 years, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes the DMs are useful to answer, but I remember there was a time, I think when we first got that co-working space where I was like, oh man, Gary V does every single DM. I'm going to do that. And I would come in early and I would spend like a literal hour just answering Instagram DMs. And I was like obsessed with the purity aspect of it. He does every single one. I'm going to do every single one. And I realized like, you know, 90% of the ones that he's answering, he just answers with a single emoji. And it's like, oh, cool. Gary V answered me. But did he actually engage with me or was he just, was I one one more number in his list of I must complete this list. You know, and I yeah. realized like what he says is like, you got to care about your audience. and You got to hustle. And like to a degree, that's true. But on like if we zoom in on me as the individual who sent him a DM, what am I really getting out of this interaction? And is that the interaction that's best for me and him? Probably not. So yeah. focus on what's really important. You're going to realize that a lot of it is intangible and hopefully by uh, consciously admitting that to yourself, you won't feel so guilty when what you're doing doesn't tie to some easily visible metric. Yeah. Uh, last question. Why are you quitting and not just releasing an episode every few months like Dan Carlin does? So <laughs> I actually mentioned- I'm not as cool as Dan Carlin. I'm not as cool as Dan Carlin. I mean, look, the one thing I'll say is, yeah, Dan Carlin is releasing an episode every few months, but it's like a five hour episode. That dude is putting in work and I'm, I can't speak for Dan. I don't know, Dan. I don't know if he's like just dicking around every day and then shows up at the studio and just happens to know all this history stuff. But from the amount of detail you hear in those episodes and the length of them, uh, I would assume that, yeah, it takes three months. It takes three months of research and construction <laughs> to produce something of that level of quality and length. Like he couldn't be putting out a five hour supernova in the East every other week. It just wouldn't happen. So that is what that guy is focused on. And that is the reason why I'm not saying, Hey, we'll probably come every few months and just do an episode because I want to focus on other things. And if I leave the door open for myself, you know, I know like it might be like a, a thing where I get right back into it. Um, you know, it, like part of the reason that we kept doing the podcast is it was an income driver for the business as well. And a lot of times when you have several income sources, it can become very tempting to try to focus on all of them and keep them all juggling in the air. And while diversification is important, focus is as well. And what I want to achieve is more consistency, better content on the main channel. And I just don't think I can do that if I'm trying to juggle other things. So yeah. it's not even necessarily the recording. It's the mental, the mental weight of the obligation and the research and the but many more hours go into this than just the part where we're talking. Yeah. And, and also like, so I think this has been a good episode, but you know, when it's, when it's every other week, it just, we just kind of get to the point where we're like, well, have we done anything recently that is worth talking about an advice podcast? Yeah, like Haven't had enough <laughs> chance to like, you know, I've, I've been saying I've been working on a song for like three episodes now. And like, I haven't had a time to do it yet. Yeah. Which I guess like this, this would be an answer for that. Just do it every few months or something. But, you know, I don't know. I think that if we do that kind of thing, then it makes more sense to put it on the main channel anyway. Yeah. So I just don't think there's a huge reason to be like, yeah, I do this podcast still. It's It feels like like saying, hey, it's ended is the right thing to do but we can still talk. We can still make things together just, you know, in a different format or on a different show, or maybe at some point we're like, okay, we want to do a show on, I don't want to commit to anything here, but like say we, we want to do a show on personal finance or something. That would be a new thing, new venture, new area of focus. And there's direction there. And I think that's the main thing I want yeah. is direction. So yeah, those are all the questions. We got through all of them. 
Uh, at least all yeah, the ones that, experts. that I was uh, able to find on that tweet when I copied them over this morning. So, hey, we're still on Twitter. I'm still Tom Frankly, and Martin is still Yo Martholomew. So, you know, I'll answer questions on Twitter. I'm actually pretty active on Twitter. Maybe that's not very productive, but I do tend uh, to answer questions on Twitter yeah. when I get a chance. Look, uh, look to our other things, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, um, wherever else things might exist. Yeah. So if we talk more and put it somewhere, you'll find out. Yeah, you will find it. Main thing I want to say is thank you so much for hanging out with us. Some of you for literally eight and a half years. It's been a wild ride. Learned a lot. Uh, would recommend starting a podcast for fun. Wouldn't recommend doing it if you just think it's going to be like an income source or business. But man, I've learned a lot from doing this. We have spent a lot of time talking. Uh, it's been a great way for us to talk as you've moved. And uh, hey, I'm coming to visit you yeah. next month. So that's pretty cool. Yes, indeed. This absolutely helped with cool. my public speaking skills. Uh, it helped with a lot of other things. So it's been a great experience. I do experience. feel like a way better speaker. I was so nervous the first time we did video too. Oh, that part. yeah. I, I was like shaking a little bit. I don't know if it was visible, but like I was really nervous this whole thing. Mm -hmm. I feel way more confident. I feel like if I had a job interview today, I just, it'd be conversational. I wouldn't be intimidated in the slightest. And I think that mm -hmm. that. Being this comfortable in sort of a performative conversation, which an interview is actually, mm -hmm. it's almost like a superpower. Like that is a useful skill that you don't get a lot of practice on normally. So yeah. So yeah, maybe, maybe the torch is now being handed to somebody in our audience. To start their own podcast. Uh, but we're still doing lots of things. So if you go over to thomasjfrank.com, that's my main website. And I'm still publishing videos every week on my main channel, youtube.com slash thomasfrank. And then your website is uh, it's martinbay.me, right? It's true. Although I believe if you do yo yomartholomew.com, if that's easier to spell, you'll also get there. Also, wait, wait, martinbay.me in any spelling that I could think of, even if you misspell my last name, should work as long as it's Martin B. Some vowels that sound like A dot me. That should work. I want to test this. I'm going to do. I bought a bunch of typos knowing that my name is B -A -Y hard to spell. B-A-Y dot me. Does it work? It does. Okay. <laughs> I think I have A Y E I. Like I, I have several. Do you, but do you have so the most Martin important one, Martin B A E dot me? I, I hope so. If I missed that one, it was an obvious get that I should have gotten. You should have gotten that one. Yep, you did. Good job. Okay. Nice. So, yeah. <laughs> so Martin Bay dot me. I don't have to I don't have to use a different URL. You can misspell it all you want. That's a pretty You'll probably find it. That's a pretty good tip for uh for like get, if you have a hard to spell name just buy all the possible domains <laughs> yeah i'm just having the domain bar correct your spelling for you now you do have to pay it's, like what 10 bucks a year per I do domain have, i don't know however much of me is at this point i don't know <laughs> oh well you know sometimes your online but home yeah, base Martin is important. Bay me. you can uh you know, look at my cool pixel art and music and whatever else I do in, in the future. It could be anything. I could become a master sheep shearer and maybe I would put something about that on this site. You could do that. All right. Well, that is about going to do it for this episode. As always, the Inforium.com is where you can go to find all of the show notes. Uh, this one's going to be the Inforium.com slash 25. I think we mentioned quite a few things here. Guillermo is going to have a lot of episode to listen through. And we did mention quite a few things. Check out that personal finance tech tree. Check out Martin's cool pixel art, photography, hybrid stuff. We got all kinds of cool stuff. So check those show notes out. And uh, hey, if you're new to the show or if you've only been listening for a little while, there are a heck of a lot of episodes that we're very proud of from the history. So maybe start it over. Uh, if you want Martin to be on the show consistently, start it from around episode 100 or so. I think 100 specifically. Yeah, I came back and, and then... Yeah. is with Cal Newport, I think, uh, and then you're after a, there afterwards. Uh, somewhere around there, we stop having guests most of the time, yeah. and then ever. So yeah, yeah, around 100 is the right time. Ooh, you are, on, you are on the podcast pretty much from when the YouTube channel starts posting, because we didn't post the first 99 or so on the YouTube channel. We just started with, the, uh, with like episode 100, I think, because that's when we first also started having uh, Anna do thumbnails. And then eventually yeah. Ashley started doing the thumbnails. 
So yeah, that's all going to be online as long as I am able to keep it online. So it's going nowhere. I like to leave an archive, both because I think it's useful, but also I think it's useful to see how creators were able to grow over time. I loved getting to go see the original versions of the websites for uh, like, of my heroes. <laughs> like uh, I went to the Wayback Machine and looked at Pat Flynn's website from when it began. I'm like, dang, that looks like just as crappy as my website did when I started. Okay, cool. <laughs> it looks amazing now. So, hey, we all kind of started at the same point and we just put in the work. You keep doing things. So anyway, thanks as always for hanging out with us and we'll continue to hang out over on the YouTube channel, on Twitter, on all kinds of other platforms. And thanks for uh, being a listener of this show. It's been an awesome eight years and we will see you later on. Oh yeah, stay cute. <laughs> <laughs>